years ago, I spoke at Together for the Gospel on divine immutability, and I tried to take that doctrine and look at it exegetically and then through the lens and the categories and controversies of systematic theology and then to come to apply it personally and appropriately. What I did two years ago with the attribute of God's immutability, I'd like to do today with the attribute of God's goodness. And so we're going to start in the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is about the God who makes himself known. Throughout this book, we see God showing himself to Moses, to Pharaoh, to the Egyptians, to the Israelites, constantly revealing who he is, what he is like. He's the God of power, the God of signs and wonders, the God of grace and glory. And in chapter 33, he makes himself known as the God of goodness. The Israelites are facing an unprecedented challenge in Exodus 33. The God who brought them out of Egypt has said he can no longer be with them. That's verses 1 through 3. The idolatry with the golden calf has proven catastrophic. I'll send an angel before you, the Lord says, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people." Verse 3, in response to this announcement, the people do two things, verses 4 through 6. First, they mourn, and second, they take off their ornaments. A little curious what's meant by ornaments. The text explains they did so because God had asked them to. As best as we can figure, to remove their ornaments was a way of removing any fancy adornment, uh, sig signaling perhaps that they were entering into a season of Mourning, and more than that, it may have been a way of ridding themselves of any idolatrous associations. After all, where did a recently slave people get any fancy adornments? They got them from the Egyptians. So they rid themselves and they mourn and they enter into a time of mourning. They had moved into idolatry with the golden calf, and now they were putting away any remnants of that idolatry. And just incidentally, isn't it ironic? They wanted a God they could see. That was the impetus behind the calf. They thought that if they did things their way, they could have more of God. But now they are threatened with less of God. The invisible God they wanted to see now threatens to leave them all together. So mark it very well. Idolatry is always the pursuit of short-term gain for the assurance of long-term loss. After the people respond, we see Moses respond. He makes three requests of the Lord. One, please be with me, verses 12 through 14. Two, please be with us verses 15 and 16, and then three, please show me your glory. Now, Moses had already seen plenty of God's glory. He saw the burning bush, he saw the rod turn to a snake, ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, a pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. But now Moses is asking for something even greater, even fuller. He wants as much divine glory as he can handle. He wants more than a lightning bolt or a cloud, he wants to see God like he talks to God face to face. Of course, he can't get everything he asks for. Moses is not able to handle a full-on glimpse of God's glory. You see the shadows of the sun. We can feel the warmth of the sun. We can see the bright rays from the sun, but you cannot safely stare into the sun. God will hide Moses in the cleft of the rock. He will cause his backside to be seen, as it were. God's back, not literally his back, God doesn't literally have a body. It's probably a figure of speech, meaning not his face. It's unlikely that Moses saw anything. Instead, he saw as the Bible would have it, by hearing. Moses said, Exodus 33, verse 18, please show me your glory. 
And the Lord said, note this, verse 19, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Moses asks for glory, God promises goodness. The two cannot be separated. If glory is the weight and worth of God, then goodness is the blessing and bounty of God. What Moses sees is actually a declaration of God's name and character. I will proclaim my name before you, the Lord. That is, you will see my goodness, Moses, as I reveal to you my divine name, my covenant name, Yahweh, Jehovah, the I am that I am, the self-existent one, that I am your covenant God, your creator God, that will be a display of my goodness. And, he then states, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So, do you see how it fits together? God's glory, God's goodness, God's sovereign grace. The freedom of God to dispense His mercy to whomever He pleases, apart from any constraint outside of His own will, is what it means for God to be glorious and for God to be good. The Lord hears Moses' request. He will not leave them. He will not forsake them. He will go with them to the promised land. That's the gospel, Emmanuel, God with us, and not just any God, but the never-failing, never-changing, all-surpassing God of goodness. He is with us. That's the heartbeat of Exodus 33, and that's the good news, and that's what I want us to reflect on. I have four main headings as we try to look at and unpack the attribute of divine goodness. First, we will look at the nature of God's goodness. Second, objections to God's goodness. Third, the display of God's goodness. And fourth, our response to God's goodness. Under each of these main headings, there will be other points, subpoints, but this at least will give us a general roadmap of where we are going. First then, big category, the nature of God's goodness. And before coming to a simple definition of God's goodness and what it is, let's talk about what it is not. We do not mean that God is simply useful or relatively good. If we say, that's a good lawnmower, we mean it works, it's reliable, it starts, it gets the job done. If we say, mmm, this hot dog is good, we're not saying something about the essence of all hot dogdom. We are saying, well, this is better than a lot of hot dogs I've had. God is not good because He's useful. He's not good because He compares favorably to others, though that's true. By goodness, we are not referring simply to the perfection of God's essence, though God is good in His essence. Goodness is an essential attribute, but we do not mean that God is constituted rightly in all that he has and does. That was sort of the classical Greek way of understanding goodness. But that's not what we mean, or at least not all that we mean. Likewise, we do not simply mean that God is morally exemplary or ethically upright. Now, that's true as well, but let's not confuse goodness with holiness, related but distinct. Nor do we simply mean that God is merciful. We'll talk about that. That's a wonderful element of God's goodness. We see it in Exodus 33. The two things, goodness and mercy, cannot be separated. But strictly speaking, God's goodness extends farther than His mercy. Mercy may be the ultimate, in some sense the highest expression of God's goodness, but it is not the only expression. Think about it. God shows mercy to some, but as we will see, His goodness extends to all. 
So what then do we mean by God's goodness? Here's a definition. Divine goodness is the overflowing bounty of God by which he who receives nothing and lacks nothing communicates blessing to his creation and to his creatures. So goodness is the overflowing bounty of God. God's goodness is the opposite of harshness and cruelty. To experience divine goodness is to enjoy the sweetness, the friendliness, the benevolence, the generosity of God. Goodness is the broader category encompassing several of God's moral attributes. His goodness toward those in misery we call mercy. His goodness to forbear with those deserving judgment we call patience. His goodness to those who are guilty we call grace. Theologians speak of God's goodness in a threefold way, as necessary, voluntary, and communicative. God's goodness is necessary. That means God cannot be other than completely, perfectly, unalterably good. Goodness is what He does, it is also who He is. Psalm 25, 8, good and upright is the Lord. Or Psalm 119, 68, good are you, Lord, and you do good. I'm uh, going to date myself here as someone uh, fast approaching middle age, or you say already there, Kevin. If you're younger than me, you've probably never heard of Maxwell House coffee, and uh, if you're a coffee snob, I, I've never had a cup of coffee in, in my life. I just go straight to the good stuff and get some Mountain Dew. But uh, you, you, you've certainly not had Maxwell House coffee. It's not considered usually the pinnacle of all things coffee. But for almost 100 years, they were the best-selling coffee in America, and their slogan, at least as I remember it growing up on the commercials, was good to the last drop. Well, no one in all the universe is good to the last drop except for God. Remember what Jesus told the rich young man, no one is good except God alone. And of course, He didn't mean that human beings are incapable of doing good or possessing a relative degree of goodness. He meant rather that God alone is in Himself originally, infinitely, and immutably good. He's good in the highest degree. He, he has goodness that can never increase nor decrease. He is all good, unmixedly good. He is like the sun in which there is only light and no darkness at all. That is what we mean when we say God is necessarily good. At the same time, His goodness is Voluntary. That may seem like a contradiction. Either God must be good or God wills to be good. How can He be both? His eternal and intrinsic goodness is necessary. That is necessary to Him. He would not be God if He could cease to be good. But His will to communicate this goodness with others is voluntary. In other words, it was necessary that whatever God would create would be good, but it was not necessary that God would create in the first place. As Stephen Sharnock puts it in his book, The Existence and Attributes of God, which is just about the, the best place to go outside of the Bible to do a deep dive on any of these attributes, he says, God is necessarily good in His nature but free in his communication of it. In other words, it was not incumbent upon God to will that his goodness rest on any outside of himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit do and always have existed in eternal happiness. 
The three persons of the Trinity mutually indwell one another such that they delight in their shared goodness and glory. God did not have to go outside of Himself to experience goodness or love or to have that love or goodness be focused upon another. God did not have to create the universe in order to be conscious of that goodness. No, the fact that God willed to display divine goodness is a further expression of that goodness, which leads to a third point, necessary, voluntary, and God's goodness is third, communicative. What does that mean? It means God wills for His goodness to be known and enjoyed. There's a a distinction between envy and jealousy. God is incapable of envy. Jealousy is the unwillingness to give up what is yours. You have it, it belongs to you. Perhaps you're right in your estimation of it belonging to you. Perhaps you're wrong. But jealousy is, I have it, I will not give it to another. It's not necessarily wrong to be jealous. God, at one place, is called by the name jealous. To have a jealous husband or wife is not necessarily good. It could be an expression of of their love and commitment to not forsake one another. But envy is different. Envy is the unwillingness to have others enjoy what you want. Jealousy says, this is mine. Envy says, I don't want you to have anything good in yourself. God cannot be envious. He never looks upon the beneficence of others or the delight of others and is somehow miserly in His estimation of it. How could He be? For God lacks nothing. He has everything. In His goodness, He is desirous that others partake of it. Whatever good we have or whatever good we enjoy is due to the gracious communication of God's goodness. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, James 1, 17. So food is good, marriage is good, friendship is good, health is good, peace is good, prosperity is good, work is good, recreation is good, rest is good, all because God is good. He is a benevolent creator. What did Jesus tell us? Matthew 5, but He makes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends His rain on the just and the unjust. So whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, every excellent thing is overflowing from the goodness of God. God communicates His goodness not with a miserliness as if He were Scrooge McDuck begrudgingly allow us to swim in His money bin of gold coins that he hoards to himself. No, God communicates his goodness with unspeakable pleasure. He loves to make his goodness known. He delights for the bounty of his goodness to spill over to others. The supply of his goodness is inexhaustible, and the sharing of it knows no end. God's goodness is necessary, voluntary, and it is communicative. That's all the first big heading. Second, just briefly, we must speak to some objections to God's goodness. Now, this could easily turn into a message or lecture or sermon on the problem of evil. I'm not going to pretend to answer every exegetical, existential, theological question one may have with the goodness of God. Certainly many of us, all of us are deep in our hearts asking some questions about that in in these days. At one level, the problem of evil is only answered, so-called, by seeing the Creator for who He is. That's the end of Job. Job's answer out of the whirlwind from God is not a 
syllogistic discourse, but a grand picture of who God is. So when we know who God is, when we see what Christ did on the cross, when we take God at His word, those are the best answers to the problem of evil. But let's be honest, it's hard to hear a message on the goodness of God, especially perhaps in these weeks and months, without feeling some kind of response well up within us that says, yeah, but… So a few objections. For starters, someone might ask, what about the unequal distribution of God's goodness? Uh, We look around and sure God is good, but it sure seems like He is so much better to some than to others. How is that fair? But God's goodness, we must remember, is distributed according to grace, not according to merit. Like the master of the house asks in Matthew 20, am am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? If I want to give to the workers who came at the first hour the same as those who came at the eleventh hour, it's my benevolence to distribute. Moreover, who is to say that we see the distribution of God's goodness in the same way God does? You you may feel like I've surely been given more goodness than other people, or you've uh, somehow come out on the short end of the stick. But who's to say that we're seeing things as God has distributed them? Every day, one of my kids accuses me of being unfair. There is always someone in the house who thinks, I have not distributed the chore money as I ought, or the dessert was not apportioned correctly, or the bedtime for another child was too generous. And yet, as a parent, I realize my children do not view the world with infallible accuracy. Now, I'm a sinful, selfish father, but I'm quite certain that my wife and I have communicated more goodness to our children than they realize, and they are not the best judge of the distribution of it. Here's a second objection. Someone might ask, well, what about punishment and retribution? Many people, even some Christians, believe that divine wrath is incompatible with divine goodness. But to punish evil whether in this life partially or in the next life eternally, is not a mark against God's goodness. It is the expression of it. God could not be good and leave injustice unchecked. Would we think a man good if he had the same affection for vice as for virtue? If he had the same inclination toward, the same movement of his will toward adopting puppies as he did toward kicking them, we would think a man the opposite of good if he concluded that kindness was as morally worthy or as morally repugnant as treachery, or if he assessed that lying and stealing was of the same moral esteem as honesty and generosity. Well, in the same way, God would not be good if He were indifferent to the difference between goodness and badness. Well, you you might think, surely God can disapprove of evil without having to punish it. Can't God disapprove of it and not be drawn to it, but perhaps just a, a, a snap of His cosmic fingers just be gone with it? But that would be to separate God's justice from His other attributes. The fact that so many of us wish for God to casually dismiss evil is a sign that we do not understand the moral horror of sin, and perhaps for some, that we have not felt the personal horror of injustice against us. In the face of unrestrained evil, the response of the good man is that something must be done to right this wrong. The answer to the question in Genesis 18.25, shall not the judge of all the earth do right, must be, yes, of course, he will do right. 
Of course, he will not be indifferent to righteousness, nor will he be indifferent or overlook wickedness. And that means a just recompense upon evil. As William Shedd puts it, the sovereignty and freedom of God in respect to justice, therefore, relates not to the abolition nor to the relaxation, but to the substitution of punishment. It does not consist in any power to violate or waive legal claims. So we must never think that what Christ accomplished on the cross was some act of legal fiction. God does not justify sinners by waiving legal claims. We are saved not by the setting aside of justice, but by the fulfilling of justice. This is the whole logic of Romans 3. How can God be both just and the justifier? It's unthinkable in Paul's mind that God could simply set aside the horror of moral evil and just wave it away with a wand or a snap of His fingers. No, it must be dealt with. The freedom of God is not to ignore evil, but that He might graciously provide a substitute for it. God is free to punish sin by means of a substitute, but His holiness and goodness cannot allow sin to go unpunished altogether. And then a a third possible objection, someone might say, what about the presence of suffering in my life and in the world? This is no doubt the most immediately existentially difficult of the uh, the objections. We have a very hard time believing that suffering can be an expression or even concurrent with divine goodness. Uh, Let me just honestly personalize that. I, I have a hard time accepting that suffering could be an expression or even concurrent with divine goodness. But again, if we think about it, we know from experience this can be the case. When you give your child some nasty medicine she needs, but she's squirming and fighting and everything in in her screams against it, is that not an expression of your parental goodness? When I remove a splinter from my little boy's toe, though he is yelling at me the whole time as if I were a Civil War surgeon doing some sort of amputation, I remove that splinter as a good father, though it is not felt nor experienced as good for my son in that moment. I don't know what God is doing in your life with your suffering. I don't know all that He means to do in our world with a global pandemic. But we know from the Bible there are dozens and hundreds of good things that He is doing. Psalm 119, 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. God wants to wean us from the things of the world. He wants us to be wise to His commands, and He wants to warn us of coming judgment. Whatever else God is doing with COVID-19, surely one of the things He is doing is issuing a gracious invitation to repent. As John Piper has pointed out before from Luke chapter 13, part of what Jesus wants to do there is to move the locus of astonishment from how can such a terrible thing befall us to astonishment. Why was something worse not done and why has it not come upon me? It is the goodness of God that would rather have us penitent than punished. It's not the only thing to say about suffering. It's certainly not the only thing to say about a pandemic, but it is one thing we must not be afraid of saying in these times, that God is issuing and extending a gracious invitation that we might repent and be saved. Third, third category. Those were some objections to God's goodness. Let's look more carefully at the display of God's goodness. We are all living in the midst of an unprecedented time. It's not often 
that you can be in the middle of something and know for certain that these days and weeks and months will be remembered and recorded for the rest of our lives. We don't want to make light of the difficulties people are facing or the need to grieve or the biblical hope that can be found in lament. So to reflect on God's goodness is is not a stiff arm to people in the midst of tears. At the same time, it would be untrue to the Scriptures and untrue to God and unhelpful to ourselves if we did not exalt in all that God has and all that God is. For those with Christ wrought, Christ bought, Christ through the Spirit applied sight, there have always been and always will be countless evidences of God's goodness. If you've gotten the hint that I'm looking at these points in threes, you're right, so let me give you three more. We see the display of God's goodness chiefly in three areas, in creation, in providence, and in redemption. First, we see God's goodness in creation. Remember, God did not have to create the world. He did so, at least in part, to communicate goodness to us. Remember, the constant refrain throughout the creation week, and God saw that it was good. And we come to the climax of the sixth day with the events of Genesis 2, I think already having taken place. Genesis 1 is the the broad angle and then the wide angle, and then Genesis 2 is the zoom angle to look at the creation of man and woman. We come to the end of Genesis 1 with the helpmate, the woman, fit for the man, all in place, and we read, God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. God made the world for man. God was a benefactor for us before we could offer any response of obedience or worship to Him. The earth is the full of the goodness of the Lord, Psalm 33, 5. God gave mountains and beaches as a gift. He gave trees and flowers as a gift. He gave marriage as a gift. He gave the reproductive capacity for children as a gift. He gave the moon and the stars as a gift. He gave the sun as a gift. He crowned us with glory and honor above all else in the material world as a gift. Most of us grow dull to the wonder, the beauty, the bounty God has provided for us in creation. Do you have your windows open The weather gets a little warmer in many parts of the country. Keep your windows open at night. Sometimes uh, those birds get up so early, I want to keep sleeping. My wife can keep sleeping through them, and she loves to hear them. They're so loud that they wake me up. But it's a wonderful way to wake up, the sound of a multitude of chirping birds in the spring. Can you hear the goodness of God? Do you see the goodness in the leaves returning to the trees? No no one had a master plan to go save them from last year and house them in some storehouse and bring them out and some government program to come staple them all back up on the trees. They come back because God is God. Do you see flowers blooming? Maybe you see deer from your front porch or pigeons or squirrels or ants working their little abdomens off. Maybe you see roses or tulips or a flowering dogwood tree. Even the wild lilies of the field are arrayed in splendor greater than great King Solomon. During some of this quarantine, looking for things to watch with the absence of sports, been watching the show on Netflix about extraordinary homes. A British architect and a British actress travel the world to discover these amazing architectural designs, amazing locations. In, in one episode, they tour this nine-bedroom house built into the side of a hill on a Greek island, which is 
not a bad place to ride out a quarantine. They finish the segment there by overlooking the sea, facing west to watch a picture-perfect sunset, and the woman says something like, I defy anyone to sit here and see this and tell me this isn't paradise. Yeah, okay, but for a moment I thought she was going to make a brilliant theological statement. I defy anyone to sit here and see this and tell me there isn't a God. Mother Nature didn't make that sunset. No human created it. God made it. And He delights in the goodness of what He has made, and He delights to see and display the splendor of His creation again and again. There's this wonderful paragraph from G.K. Chesterton explaining this in his memorable way. He writes, "'Because children have a bounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but He never got tired of making them. It may be that He has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. The repetition in nature may not be a mere recurrence. It may be a theatrical encore. I know this to be abundantly true, so does every parent, grandparent out there, anyone with a niece or a nephew, anyone who's had a young one in the nursery. I have a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old and a 6-year-old and a 3-year-old and a 1-year-old. Just the other night, the 1-year-old was reaching into this big basket on the floor in my study, and he was pulling out our collection of Nerf balls. He would lean over with his baby-sized gut into the basket, pick up a ball, throw it on the ground, laugh. I'd grab the ball, I'd toss it back into the basket, and he'd laugh hysterically. And he'd get the same ball, and he'd throw it back on the ground, and I'd throw it back in the basket, and he kept on doing this and doing this until several minutes later I told my wife he would be happy doing this until Jesus came back. Children are the ones with the capacity for monotonous delight in the good gifts of creation. We are so often the ones whose eyesight has grown dim and old. We see God's goodness in creation. We see God's goodness in providence. It would be enough goodness were God to have created the world and then let it run on its own, but the God of the Bible is no deist God. His goodness did not stop after the sixth day of Genesis 1. His generosity is seen in providentially sustaining and caring for all that He has made. He preserves both man and beast, Psalm 36, 6. He opens His hand to supply the desire of every living thing, Psalm 145, 16. God has not left Himself without a witness, Paul says in Acts 14, for He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. God cares for even the animals, so much so that they make an appearance in the Ten Commandments. You should give your cattle the day off on the Sabbath. He does not allow the ox to be muzzled while it treads out the grain. And the book of Jonah ends by saying that God has concern for that great city of Nineveh with all those persons and much cattle. He provides for the crying ravens, Psalm 147.9, and the hungry lions, Psalm 104.21. Don't think that, that Mufasa and Simba and Nala eat on account of some quasi-mystical, impersonal circle of life. They eat because God gives them food. And think of all the ways God provides beyond the world of nature. He gives us His law that we might know how to obey Him, how to live at peace with one another. He institutes government for the protection of life and the promotion of justice. 
He restrains human wickedness. He gives us His Word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He guides our steps. He works all things after the counsel of His will. The Lord is good to all, Psalm 145, 9, and tender mercies are over all His works. We see His goodness in creation, in providence, and supremely so in redemption. That the Father would promise our salvation from eternity, that the Son would seal our salvation in His blood, that the Spirit would apply the blessings of our salvation through faith are all evidences of God's singular goodness to the believer. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you, Psalm 86, 5. The God who had no need of creating the world has even less need of redeeming it from the sin in the garden to the idolatry of the golden calf to the evil of Golgotha. There was an utter lack of deserving on the part of God's people. After multiple provocations, there was no reason outside of God's own covenant faithfulness to secure a plan of redemption. There was no inducement to help except for His own goodness. And when He helped... Oh, how He helped. He gave us better than wealth, better than worlds. God gave His Son, and at such a cost, we could rightly say that during Christ's humiliation, and supremely so on the cross, God's goodness was manifested more to us than to His own Son. God has made known to us the path of life, and all we need to walk down that path is to repent and believe. He has given us an embarrassment of riches in His Son, and He gives access to those riches by means of such an easy yoke. He appeals to us, not with a show of brute force, but with heartfelt entreaties, wooing us by the kindness of Christ our Savior. And when we turn to Him, He eagerly accepts us. I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Psalm 32, 5. As Sharnock puts it, He is the true Father that hath a quicker pace in meeting than the prodigal hath in returning. That's good. Think on that. He runs to us faster than we run to Him. That's the goodness of God. Systematic theology sometimes distinguishes between God's love of benevolence and God's love of complacency. The distinction is applied in different ways by different theologians, but most broadly it means that while God loves all creatures in a general way, He has a special love for His people, for His children. Bavink says, now indeed, it is possible to speak of God's love to creatures or people in general, the love of benevolence, but for this, the Scripture mostly uses the word goodness, and as a rule, speaks of God's love, like His grace, only in relation to His chosen people or church, the love of friendship. The love of benevolence is God's goodness to all people. The love of friendship or the love of complacency is God's special delight in His people. Now, that sounds strange to us. Complacency sounds like God's just going, oh, well, whatever, Uh, I guess I love you. But our word comes from the Latin complacens, meaning very pleasing. Complacency refers not to divine inaction, there can be no such thing as passivity in God, but to divine satisfaction. God takes pleasure in His own goodness found in His justified, sanctified creatures. The act of redemption originated in God's goodness, was executed in God's goodness, and finds its telos in the delight of God's goodness. You see His goodness displayed, creation, providence, redemption, which brings us to our last heading, our response our response to God's goodness. This message is nothing if not orderly. We've had three points so far, under uh, each of which have three sub-points. And so, on this fourth point, no, no sense in breaking the pattern. 
Let me give you three words that ought to describe our response to God's goodness. The first word is supplicate. Let us run to God with our prayers. Do you know the command Jesus issues most often with regard to prayer? Ask. Go. Knock on the door of heaven. Keep pleading with the judge. Remember the lesson of the persistent widow. And He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. If we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? God is delighted to open His hand toward us. Cast all, not some, not just the big ones, not not a few, cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. His liberality exceeds our deserving and ultimately exceeds even our desires. God gives more than we had the wisdom or the daring to request. He is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or imagine. We have a sympathetic high priest in heaven. Let us therefore with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. God is unwearied by our solicitations. It is the nature of His goodness to be pleased with our seeking after it. There is no petition too big that it would be a burden for God and no supplication too small that it would be bothersome to Him. God is good and He loves to hear from all of those who believe that His goodness cannot be exhausted. Supplicate. The second word is imitate. Let our hearts Be large toward our fellow creatures, just as the Creator is toward us. Shall we hoard His goodness, not distributing it to those in need? Should we be like a grocery store filled with food and not open our doors in the time of a pandemic? If we freely pass along God's bounty, we will find His goodness to be like the loaves and fishes that kept on multiplying, or like the widow's oil that never ran empty. Let us be especially liberal in showing goodness to our enemies, to those who hate us, to those who misunderstand us, to those who mistreat us, to those who tweet all manner of evil against us. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So seeds of goodness even upon your enemies. It will not demean you. God did not disparage Himself to treat us better than we deserved. It is surely not beneath us then to imitate God in showing kindness to the mean, to the morose. Why has God seemingly bestowed more goodness upon some except that we might have the honor of imitating Him and sharing that goodness with others. Again, Sharnock says, if His hand and bowels be open to us, let ours not be shut to any. Supplicate, imitate, finally, meditate. I admit I'm fudging just a bit to line up my words here, but the last word, uh, meditate, I don't mean simple mental reflection, though that's worthwhile. Rather, by meditate, I mean let the goodness of God shape every bit of who you are and how you see the world. If God is good in His essence and the never-failing, never-changing, all-surpassing source of all that is good in the world, how unworthy our base and accusing thoughts of Him Let us say instead with the psalmist, whom have I in heaven but you, and there is none on earth I desire besides you. The goodness of God should make us humble. All that we have by way of joy and laughter and food and friends and babies and puppies and kittens and daisies are a gift from His hand. The goodness of God should make us patient and trusting. Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good unto those who wait for Him. There's a wonderful children's book. It's, 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 it, watch out. It'll, it'll tear you up. 
It's by Johnny Gibson and the illustrator Joe Hawks. It's called The Moon is Always Round. It's about Johnny and his wife losing a child. The short book is it's moving, and the lesson it offers is simple, and yet it is profound. When you see the moon at night, depending on the time of the month, the moon may be a half circle, may be a crescent, it may barely be a sliver of light. You may not even see it at all. But that doesn't mean the moon has changed its shape. The moon is always round, and God is always good, even when the light seems dim. It's like that famous line from Spurgeon, God is too good to be unkind, and He is too wise to be mistaken, and when we cannot trace His hand, we must trust His heart. The goodness of God should make us thankful. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, is often the psalmist's refrain. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, a God of inexhaustible bounty and beauty and blessing is a God who is worthy of praise, who has given us every reason for gratitude. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And do you see, as we meditate on the goodness of God, how it should stir us to worship? One more from Sharnock. He says, infinite cheerfulness attends infinite goodness. Do you believe that there is such a God in heaven? Do you believe this God does not dwell in heaven disinterested in our estate? There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of Your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound, Psalm 4 tells us. The God of infinite cheerfulness and the God of infinite goodness is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father of all those who come in the name of His Son. Let us not doubt His benevolence. Let us be public in our praise of Him, profuse in our love for Him. Let us have eyes to behold the sunshine of His mercy. Let us have mouths to feast upon His grace. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Heavenly Father, we ask that You would give us that sight. You would give us that taste. You would make us humble people, thankful people, seeing people, and would communicate to us once again in these days your never-failing, never-changing, all-surpassing goodness. And we would delight. In Jesus we pray. Amen.